Hey everyone, it's Colin, how's it going? In a previous video, I showed you how I got my Wii U connected using wired networking. For the purposes of that video, it was to show if there was a difference in network performance between wired and wireless on the Wii U. But ultimately, I ended up leaving the Wii U connected using wired, which is something that I do with all of my game consoles and really any network device that I have if it's an option. Wireless networking is great technology, but it still does have its downfalls even in 2015. One thing you need to consider though is when you get your home theater wired up with all of your game consoles is the spaghetti mess of cables you may end up with in the end. So creating custom length ethernet cables becomes very important, especially for neat freaks like me. So I figured this would be a great opportunity to show you how you can make your own custom length network cables the right way. First, let's talk about the cable itself. There are many different varieties of Ethernet cable, shielded, unshielded, and then different categories of it from the original specs back in the 80s up until modern specs and even the new ones that haven't been created yet. They're still in the proposal stage. For most part, in home networking, you're going to see one of two types of Ethernet cable called CAT5E or CAT6. CAT is simply short for category, and the category defines really the physical properties of the cable itself. So CAT5E and CAT6 cable for home use are, for the most part, interchangeable. CAT5E is a little bit easier to work with, and it's also a bit cheaper, but prices are really starting to come into parity with each other. So when it comes to buying cable, all I can say is get whatever is the better deal. You can buy cable in bulk. It usually comes in thousand foot spools. And a thousand foot spool of cable is gonna run you anywhere between 100 and 150 bucks based on the quality and type that you get. The other way to buy cable is in pre-made patch links. And you can get these in various lengths from half a foot all the way up to 100 feet. But what if you need something that's exactly two and a half feet long? Well, usually you end up going from one foot to two foot to five foot to seven foot lengths. They don't really make many custom length cables in those shorter distances like that. So what we're going to do today is show you how you can take a pre-made patch cable and really kind of cut it down to length. This is going to be the most economical way to do it because a 100 foot patch cable is going to be usually about 20 bucks or so and you can get multiple short cables out of it. So let's take a look at the tools that you'll need and there's only a few. The first is going to be a network cable crimper. These have a die in the end that are used to crimp the ends onto the network cable. They've also got a built-in section that's used to strip the sheathing off the outside of the cable and I'll show you how to use that in a second. These tools can be expensive if you want a really nice one, but a basic inexpensive one is still pretty cheap, anywhere between 10 and 20 bucks. The other thing that you're really going to need is a nice pair of scissors. And don't use like your significant other's really nice sewing scissors or anything like that because these are going to end up getting dull. If you're working with CAT6 cable, another thing that's going to come in very handy is a pair of diagonal cutters. You don't need this for CAT5E and I'll show you why in just a moment. So in terms of supplies, you're only really going to need one other than the cable stock itself, and that is an RJ45 connector. You can buy these in a bag of 100 for just a few bucks. They're really pretty cheap. I like these all-in-one type. There are a few kinds that come as multiple pieces, but I find that they're harder to work with and not as reliable. Okay, so let's go ahead and get the cable made. First, you're going to want to cut your cable to length, and I do recommend using the scissors for this. So here's how you strip the insulation off of the end of the cable. You're going to want to measure out a little less than an inch worth, say about two centimeters, and then use the cable stripping blade built into your cable crimpers in order to do the work. It's this little curved section in here. Now keep in mind that you usually can squeeze these down pretty tight, but if you do, the blade is going to sink into the cable too much. It'll end up actually scoring, if not cutting, the inner conductors inside the cable. So all you want to do really is just score the outer jacket of the cable just deep enough so that it'll come free. This takes a little bit of finesse and practice, so you may want to cut your first cable a bit longer than normal, so if you need to, you can cut it back and try again but after a few times you'll get the hang of it. You simply stick the cable in there and then spin it around inside that die to score around 
where you want to make that cut. Then simply twist off that outer piece of insulation. Carefully inspect those wires on the inside to make sure that you didn't nick or cut them, but provided that they look okay, you should be good to move on. Here's where those diagonal cutters come in handy. If you're using CAT6 cable like I am here, you're gonna to wanna to cut out that inner divider. So here's how I like to deal with that inner divider. I'll take the individual pairs of wires and bend them over the outside of the jacket like this. Then I'll use the diagonal cutters and very lightly grip that inner divider and try to stretch it upwards a little bit to give myself a little bit more working room. Then you simply cut it off and then let it kind of sink back down inside the outer jacket. That makes crimping the end on a bit easier. Now remember, you don't have to deal with this with Cat5e. Cat5e also has thinner wires, so those are a little bit easier to manage as well. But in any event, now we need to get those inside conductors set up in the correct order. There are two standards for how you set up the cable colors for these connectors. They are the T568A and 568B standards. I like to follow B because that's what most manufacturers do with patch cables. You can use A as well, it doesn't really matter. The only thing that really matters is that both ends of the cable need to match. The cable color order is like this. White orange, orange, white green, blue, white blue, green, white brown, brown. And that's going from the top to the bottom as the underside of the RJ45 is facing you, just like I'm showing here. Now that color order is important. Make sure that you aren't accidentally flipping one or two of the wires, because if you do, the cable won't work properly. I'll include a link down in the description to a diagram that shows what that color order is and how it fits in relation to the end that you're crimping on. So you can have that for future reference to make it a little bit easier. So now that you've got those in the right order like this, you're gonna to wanna to trim them flush. And I also use the scissors for this. It'll again, give you a cleaner cut. You only wanna leave about a centimeter or so of the actual cable sticking out from the jacket. Any more and you'll end up where the connector won't grip onto the jacket for strain relief properly, and any less, and you won't get the conductors all the way into the pins in that RJ45 connector. So if you take a look at the side of the RJ45, you can see the individual pins in here and how they have two teeth each. These teeth, when they get crimped down, pierce the outer jacket of each conductor and make an electrical connection. You want to make sure that the, both teeth on each of those pins are going into the cable. And then you also want to make sure that this little bar, this plastic kind of locking bar here, when it gets crimped down, is also pressing up against the outer jacket of the cable. So you've got about a centimeter or so of the inner conductor sticking out from the jacket. Try to hold the, all the wires in position, and I tend to do it like this, where I've got my finger pressing against the wires from the back side in order to hold them in order. And then quickly slide them into the RJ45. Sometimes they'll want to slip out of position because they do each need to go into their own individual channel. And sometimes they'll flip around or two will try to go into the same channel. That's okay, back it out, get them back in order and try it again. Again, this is something that's gonna take a little bit of practice, but will benefit you in the long run. Once you've got them all in there, then really press onto the cable to make sure that that RJ45 is on there tight and that you've got a sufficient amount of the exterior jacket stuck inside that RJ45 so that that locking bar will indeed grab onto it. Also take a look through the clear plastic of the RJ45 to make sure that all eight of the conductors are lined up properly and are pushed all the way to the end of the RJ45. Remember, we want both of those teeth on each pin to be able to pierce through the insulation, not just one. So once you've got everything squared up and looking good, then hold it all in place and stick it into the crimping die of your RJ45 crimping tool. Then simply squeeze it down. Some of these tools have ratchets to help make it easier, some of them don't. It doesn't really matter. As long as you squeeze it down good and tight, make sure that those pins all seat fully and that the locking bar also grabs onto the insulation. Now an optional step, but I do recommend, is to use an RJ45 cable tester to make sure that everything is wired up correctly and making good communication. And these can really vary in terms of quality and price and features. 
I have a pretty inexpensive one for use here at home. I'd like to say it was about 25 to 35 bucks. You can get these at some of the big box hardware stores as well. Here's how mine operates. You simply stick each end of the cable into the tester. So the tester itself has an RJ45 on it, and then it's got this separate little end that you can stick on the other cable. This is great for if you need to do a long run and you can't necessarily get both ends of the cable at the same place to plug into the tester. Then you simply hold down the power button for a couple of seconds and it'll run the test. As long as it says pass and all the numbers at the bottom of the screen match up with each other, then you're good to go. So hopefully this was educational, if not entertaining. I think learning this skill is really useful, especially if you plan on building any number of custom network cables. So if you liked the video, I would appreciate a thumbs up. Those do help quite a bit. If you haven't already, do subscribe. The button's right over there. And as always, thank you all so much for watching.